And this will be the prayer for Thursday. Okay. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Heavenly Father, increasingly I receive myself from your hands. This is my truth and my joy. Unceasingly, your eye rests upon me, and I live by your gaze. O oh, my Creator, my salvation, teach me in the silence of your presence to understand the mystery that I am and the fact that I am through you and before you and for you. So we're not going to get on there, Kruda. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. Ah, Tafari, I'm going to ask you to mute your mic then, okay? If that's, if that's, uh, your, if that's yours. Okay. Thanks, appreciate that. Okay, everybody. Today we're going to have... Um, few things we're going to go over and the first of course we're going to begin with uh the play pose i'm going to give you a couple minutes a short play pose of today where you will learn uh how to make your own play pose as a matter of fact that's gonna be one of the pieces of homework that i'm going to assign after this lesson okay so go ahead and finish the play pose it i'm going to follow along see how everyone's doing and then um and then we'll go from there okay so if you could just pause there, and if anybody else also has just started, um, just pause, please, and we will, you'll be able to continue after, okay? Because I'm going to, to teach the lesson now, okay? So please pay attention so that you can follow along with the lesson, okay? Today we're going to be, today we're going to be learning about this concept of faith and why is it that the biblical stories are considered a type of truth? Um, and why is Jesus and Jesus' stories, why are they considered to be with authority? Okay, and where does this all come from? It might be a little bit of a review for you. Okay, it might be some new things uh, that you've learned. But let's just have a look here and... We're going to start from the very beginning, uh, but before we start with Genesis, let's have a look. What does it mean uh, to, for something to be correct? Okay, so fallibility, to be fallible is incorrect. So infallibility means um, to be correct, to, to, to lack error. Okay, now there is uh, three different philosophies when it comes to the Bible. And this is from the Catholic Church, all three from the Catholic Church, okay? You've got this, uh, the original concept is that the, the Bible is absolutely infallible. Uh, there, no error whatsoever in, in, in the Bible, okay? Um, th then you have this limited inerrancy or infallibility. Um, and this is a more modern concept, started maybe around the 1600s or so. And here we have truths in the Bible, but certain details may not match what we observe. Okay. So, um, for example, we will look at the story of Genesis. And in, 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 the, in the biblical story, the concept of time is told over days. Right, it's it's a number of days. Well, we we know from observation that the universe and the Earth and you know it's, this has all been around a lot longer than uh, a few days, and, and and it may and it has came about took longer than one day, for example, for all the uh, creatures to you know the land creatures to be formed, but um, limited in infallibility suggests that the concept of, of things developing over time is correct. The Bible tells the story, tells the main part correctly, that it, everything evolved in a certain order. But this concept of days is, is not the part that's important. The, the original biblical writers wrote days so that it would be easy to understand. All right? It's a lot easier to understand time when you speak of seven days rather than 
billions of years, right? It's a, it's a concept that's very hard to, to, to put into practice. So if you're, if, you're, if you're telling these stories verbally, you're not writing them down. The original stories weren't written down. They were just told, right? From, pe from people to people. Well, you, you can't tell your children, um, you know, billions, X billions of years ago, this happened. And then 100 million years after that, this happened. I mean, it's not going to happen, right? And they may not have even known those numbers, right? They may not have been observing those numbers at all like we do today. But the day, telling in days gives you the, the, the order in time, right? It makes it simpler. Then there's a the concept of no um, inerrancy. Uh, so that the, the idea that the Bible itself is fallible because it is written, it is translated by human, translated by humans, um, so that there's some error in that translation, right? The ins inspiration is correct from God, and then from the translations and, and the writing down, but there are some inaccuracies all about, right? So, so in that case, somebody who thinks in this philosophy might even question this concept of things evolving, right? You know, that, that certain things evolved in a certain order. They might question that as well, okay? So we are going to, um, excuse me, we, we are going to just focus on the first two, right? That, that uh, actually the middle path here that, that there is limited inerrancy, right? There are things, there is the absolute truth, and then there are details that don't match our observations, but, it, but they're not important, they're like, right? They're not important, right? Uh, at least in terms of the big picture. Okay, here's, a, here's an interesting, I'm gonna just play you a couple of seconds of this clip here, okay? These are atheists traveling to the museum of creation. So give me your thoughts on this place. The Creation Museum. You will never find a more wretched hive of dumb and villainy. My name is Seth Andrews. I host the online community The Thinking Atheist. On October 5th, 2012, I grabbed my camera and I joined a group of fellow atheists near Petersburg, Kentucky for my first ever tour of the Creation Museum. And as I documented the experience, I also wanted to get the opinions and perspectives of the other skeptics who had driven from across the region to take the tour with me. I'm going because uh, from the first time I heard about it, I thought it was uh, just something I had to go see to believe. For me, uh, I, was, I was never a believer, never raised up in it. So when I think of exactly what they believe, young earth creationists, it goes against all that I've come to learn and understand. Being from Kentucky, I had to see this. I mean, this is just typical Kentucky. They take the Bible totally, literally, and try, and say, you know, if, if it doesn't agree with the Bible, that it must be wrong. So they, you know, the whole presuppositionalism. I'm going because I'm actually trained as a folklorist. At the same time as a folklorist, I am a non-believer. And there are some belief systems that I just personally can't wrap my head around as much as I try academically to understand. And this is an attempt to do so. What I find is very odd is that it's very close to Big Bone Lick which is one of the largest fossil finds in North America. Okay, so the one lady made an interesting uh, comment. She said that um, this museum, they, 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 and some people take the Bible very literally, okay? And, you know, if it says this, it says this exact, you know, uh, it was a snake, it was a, 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 an apple, it was a, a seven days, that, that's exactly how it was, right? Um, whereas the Catholic Church teaches a different type of um, truth, right? They teach a, a truth where all those things represent something. They're symbolic, okay? They're not literally exactly the, how it was. The people who wrote these stories, they were trying to tell the story of evolution, okay? And not and, and original sin and the nature of humanity, our flawed nature. They, they, they were, you know, really trying to say that it was, you know, seven days that everything was created, right? But this museum um, takes it literally. So if, I'm going to post this um, for you guys if you want to watch. It's quite a funny episode. We won't watch the whole thing now, but it's it's really funny. These atheists travel through the museum and make fun of and poke fun of some some um, some scenes, you know. Uh, 
maybe I should show you. Uh, there's a couple, you know, um, talking about in museum. There's like this girl playing with the dinosaur. Girl playing with the dinosaur. That's right. In the Garden of Eden, dinosaurs apparently coexisted with human beings, like pets or companions, or even close friends. As <laughs> okay, so if you take the Bible exactly, literally, word for word, you're going to end up with these kind of um, stories, okay? And uh, things will just, and then the, the main idea will get lost. The more important part will get lost, okay? So what, what I'd like to look at right now is this concept of the, the, the creation story. I think this is an excellent example of the truth in the Bible and, and how the truth in the Bible is not um, different than the truth that we discover, okay, through through observation, you know. So let's take for example, how does science, how does science describe how the universe began? Well, they have this theory. This is called the Big Bang theory, right? Where there was, at the beginning, there was nothing, right? There was this emptiness, and then through through gravitational structure i don't know all the details but they've modeled they have models right where how this could have began you know black holes and whatnot and then suddenly you had this contraction and then this big explosion okay and that set everything in motion they 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 believe this because they see the universe is constantly expanding and growing which means that if you go back in time it must have, you could it'll shrink 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 down to the original nothing well isn't that interesting this story has been in the bible almost exactly like that for thousands of years, okay? Right now, I want to take a look at the um, story in the Bible of how things came to be. So we're looking at Genesis, okay? Genesis chapter 1, the beginning, all right? And I want you to, to as I'm going through this, I want you to focus on the order of events, okay? Maybe jot yourself down on a piece of paper on your notes app or something. Uh, jot down the order of what I'm saying here. Okay, look at this. Here we go. This is this was written, you know, over four thousand years ago in, uh, by prophets inspired by God. Okay, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering. So we have this, this, um, the key word is formless and empty. In other words, nothing, right? There's darkness, darkness. And the first thing that happens, God says, let there be light. And there was light. In the big bang theory, in the scientific explanation, there is indeed darkness at the beginning of the universe and the very first thing that happens is an explosion and the first things created is light these stars right what we come to know as today as, as suns and energy right light it's very interesting that the, you know the scientists studying through these computer models and things come to a very similar story um, as we have in the bible right at the beginning Okay, so what else happens? Let's continue. God saw the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, the darkness night. There was evening and morning, and this was the first day. Okay, so, so this happens at the beginning, right? And there's a little bit of story in there about why there's darkness and light it changes during the day and, and over time, every day. Um, again, more like a children's story, right? A nice, simple little children's story. Next. God said, let, let there be um, separation between uh, the waters. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, there was morning the second day. So in the second day, things start forming, right? Atmosphere, sky, right? Water, okay? Um, this is, again, this is very similar to what, um, you know, the first thing scientists look for when they look for life on other planets, on the moon or on Mars, is they're looking for water, signs of water. Because wherever there's water, water comes first, 
and then comes life, right? Because life depends on water and moisture. Okay. Next. Uh, so that so, so that was day two, right? We have the we have the water and the atmosphere. Day two, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And so it was called. The ground was called land and the water sea. And God saw that it was good. Okay, so now we're starting to form land. Okay. Also on this third day, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants, trees, bearing fruit. Okay, God saw that it was good. There was evening, morning, and the third day. So another period of time, remember, these aren't real days. The days could be millions of years, billions of years, but it's evolving, right? From the land, the first thing that happens is vegetation. Okay, an order. There's an order here. Let's move on to the next time period. Let there be lights in the sky to separate the day and night okay and serve to signs as, as mark to mark days and years again more stars more suns appearing which you know the universe expands the universe grows more more and more of these um sources of energy and we see them we see them today in the sky right i mean we're looking at history these they're already you know so old by the time the light comes to us but it's constantly growing okay so God makes, continues with the universe expanding. This is the next time period. After that, now we have the first living creatures. Okay? In the water, they begin in the water. Let the water teem with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So the next thing that happens is sea creatures and birds. Well, there was the, you know, the, the famous um, Darwin who studied evolution. Uh, theory of evolution, studying in, in, in lands, uh, trying to figure out, you know, where, where did animals come from, where did people come from, okay? Um, he, sir, I have a question. Yes, sir, yes, yes, Stefari. I'm sure we're in off topic, though. Oh, okay, so, like, okay. You know hold on, wait till I finish then, okay? Wait till I finish right, my, right, my right, talk right, of Genesis, right. thank you. So then, We've got the we've we've got the uh, water creatures, the, the the air birds, right? And this is the order of, of that the evolutionary science teaches us, right? After these type of creatures, who evolves next? People. Wouldn't you know that in the next time period? Okay, so on on day um, six, okay, uh, we've got mankind. Let us make mankind, right, to rule over fish and sea and birds and rule over animals. So God makes the, 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 the most developed species, humans, right, kind of right towards the end. And then on the last day, you know, on the last part is um, the seventh day, just a day of rest, right? So, so we've got this story. So if we take away the days part, we've got the story of things evolving in a certain order. Beginning with darkness, and then light, and then moving on to atmosphere and water, and then um, uh, living, and then land, and then vegetation, and then simple creatures from the water and 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 the land, creepy crawly things. You know, some versions of the Bible call them creepy crawly, right? And then and then we have finally humans, the most sophisticated of them all. I mean, this is this is almost kind of word for word big bang slash evolution theory right that only today we are learning from science so so there's an excellent example of of biblical truth okay before i move on to the next uh section so far you had a question i'd be happy to answer yes mm, oh yeah so sir how do i how do i send the infographic to you Ah, no problem. So when you you're gonna uh, next time you come in, I'll show you. Okay, you can hand it in at that time. But if you want to try, you can just get the share. You, you click share when you're on that website. And you get the link and you hand the link in. Okay, you just sure. hand the, the link in. Okay, not the okay. actual. Yeah. All right, thanks, sir. You're welcome. Okay, so let's move on here. Uh, we're gonna talk now about uh, the Moses story. So the Moses story. I mean, that sounds like a pretty interesting story, right? What's, the, what's all this about slavery 
and having to and moving right large amounts of people moving having to escape and try and you know what's going on here well this is nothing that is not very much different than what we have today you know i mean we've seen a lot of this already in the past but what about right now what about right now in canada let's watch this guys watch this little clip here turn the volume up february 1st 1960 four students from a and T's. oh sorry I, I apologize wrong one this one here sorry Ontario police say they have broken up a human trafficking operation that forced 43 Mexican immigrants to work for very little pay. Arthi Pohl joins me now with the details on this. What are we learning? So what we know is that there were multiple agencies who were involved in this particular uh, investigation and in the rescue of these 43 victims of what they're calling labor human trafficking. So there was the Ontario Provincial Police as well as Barrie Police Service and Canada Border Services Agency as well. And they announced more details uh, on this rescue that uh, they conducted last week and they held this press conference today to outline some more of the details of what they've learned. Uh, they said essentially that there were 43 victims, that these were all mainly men between the ages of 20 to 46 years old who came under false pretenses to Canada, who were told that they would be getting proper employment, that they would be further. Now, did you hear that, folks? They came to Canada. They were brought to Canada pretty much as servitude slaves okay this is happening today right this is happening today so so this the story of moses is nothing new it's not a um is you know it's not some sort of make-believe story of people being enslaved right this is something that continues to this day and, um and of, and of course we uh we have different kinds of this slavery if you will um we we know about the black history movement and and the slaves from from um the african americans and, and 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 today it would appear that you know we've we've evolved our societies through uh through 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 all the the kind of um, protests and and fighting uh to get the rights that everybody uh has has equal rights but it's not um there are still things in place to keep certain groups of people from um being successful okay i'm gonna just show you a brief clip here about how education can be enslaving. February 1st, 1960, four students from A&T sat down at the lunch counter and demanded to be served. And here we are in 2009, our students can sit down at the lunch counter where they're welcome and they can't read the menu. Never in life did it ever occur to me that I would still be fighting for quality education for African-American and Latino minority kids. You know, I came from Little Rock. I actually went to Central High School, and you could not have told me that 50 years later we'd still be fighting this fight. 55 years after Brown versus Board, we still have one school system for poor, minority, and English learner children, and a better one for other children. They were passed from one grade to another, and they really didn't learn how to read. When they're coming out of school and they can't read and they can't do math, they can't get jobs. You know, we live in a knowledge economy. If kids are not prepared to compete in a knowledge economy, they're effectively doomed to second-class citizenship. When we have over half of our children of color dropping out of high school. Our world standings in education are falling. What do we need to do to make sure that every child has a quality teacher and is in a quality school? The data says that for poor minority kids especially, three good teachers in a row versus three ineffective teachers in a row can change your life trajectory. Kids will perform if they're expected to perform. If they're not expected to perform or do well or act well, they're not going to. Some people think that you can't get to college, but you know that you come from greatness and you can reach your potential, whatever you want to do. The thing is, I think a lot of people think when one person succeeds, it's at the expense of someone else. But when you educate the whole population, everyone is better off, everyone's more aware. It's better for society. You 
do not know what that one child that we say will mean to the world. All right, folks, so, you know, uh, there's a powerful, powerful reality today that um, we, slavery may not look like it did uh, 100 years ago, but there are still things in place. Now, we're fortunate here in Canada when it comes to education, we have, we have a pretty standardized system all across the board, right? It doesn't matter which high school you go to and, you know, you're kind of getting the same or which college or, or which university. They're all kind of equally valuable, right? But it's not the case down in the States. And, it, you know, it seems to me that things could change here too just as easily, okay? So, uh, you know, the story of Moses and, and, and the Jews being enslaved and treated uh, second-class citizens and then having to sort of rise up and, and fight their way you know, somewhere and, and, and whatnot. This is a powerful story. It's not, a, it's not an unusual story, okay? I mean, there's certainly something like that going on as well today. Um, and then, uh, then we get to Jesus, right? We get to Jesus. What, what makes the story of Jesus, uh, what gives it authority, first of all, right? What makes it true? Okay, I want to... Um, Start off, first of all, by going over the genealogy of Jesus, okay? Genealogy means family tree. So do you know your family tree? You know who your parents are? You probably know grandparents at some point, and then after that, what happens, right? Uh, can you draw out, you know, a long line of people? Well, it turns out that uh, two of the, of, the, of the gospel writers, um, they did that, right? They, they, and Matthew's, Matthew's account's pretty specific. So let's have a look at this. I want to just show you quickly here. Okay. Where did Jesus come from? And this is very uh, specific. I mean, this would not be, this would not be easy to make up on the top of your head. All right. Check it out. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of... Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Je Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah is the father of Shiltel, Shiltel, the father of Zerubbabel. Is Zerubbabel the father of Abihud? Abihud the father of Elikium. Elikium the father of Azor. Azor the father of Zadok. Zadok the father of Akim. Akim the father of Elihud. Elihud the father of Eliezer. Eliezer the father of Mathan. Mathan the father of Jacob. And Jacob the father of Joseph, husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called Messiah. My goodness, folks. If that's not a family tree in detail, I don't know what is. Okay? So, um, and then these are all uh, separately recorded people, right? This isn't just like some sort of random list of names. This list goes back way, way before um, Matthew's writing this down. Okay? So this is very, very well-kept lineage. Okay? They were very particular, especially with the Jewish family and the Jewish tradition. Very particular in keeping a record of who comes from who, right? So Jesus is the real thing. He comes from a particular line of people all the way back to Abraham, you know, Abraham being the first of the holy fathers of the faith, okay? And that's the genealogy, right? So I really need to point that out. Now, next, we have um, two important types of stories 
that kind of give weight or authority to Jesus. And that is the, the miracles, right? The miracle stories, uh, which kind of prove Jesus' divinity. And then we have the parables, right? Parable stories, um, you know, powerful stories told it to, to, to regular people so they could understand, you know, stories about farming and stories about relationship and, and, and whatnot, um, but that teach very important lessons that to this day are considered true lessons, right? Similar lessons you would hear from, you know, your parents or, or adults in your life, okay? Miracles and parables, all right? Um, your play pose that I'm assigning for you to create is going to be um, picking a miracle story or a parable story. And I'm giving you a list, okay? I'm going to give you this list. And then you're going to make your, your play posted assignment. Um, and, and, and it will be shared with the class, right? One by one. So one by one. Um, every day I will release one. Okay, I'm going to grade it first, and then I will release it. Okay, and they're going to be just in the order that they come in, kind of, right? Okay, it's not going to be any particular order. Okay, so maybe uh, right now I'll show you that um, that form. And uh, the reason why I'm focusing on miracles and parables, I mean, th those two types of stories really define uh, Jesus and, and, and give weight to his... Um, uh, truthfulness, if you will, right? The, the, uh, because they're they're the miracles really just prove, you know, his right. But the but the parables to this day, people continue to to look at them and be like, wow, that is so correct, you know. That is especially the older people, right, with experience who've made mistakes and not followed some of those teachings, right? Uh, they will tell you. Okay, so I'm going to show you now um, what this looks like. Okay. Just going to uh, switch the tab here for you. Okay, and what does it look like to to make a play pose? So what I've done is, uh, of course, you know how to make one, but if you forget, um, here's a video of me, you know, the same one you did for 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 this introduction. Uh, and then here is the form, right? So you're going to put your your name. And then you're going to pick one of these uh, stories, and as they as they get chosen, they they disappear, right? So um, I only really want one person doing one story. I don't want to have five stories of 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 the parable of the rich fool, right? It would get kind of boring, okay? And then please make sure you write down your choice, okay? Because once you hand the form in, it disappears, and you and I'll be like, sir, you'll be like, well, uh, you know, which one did I choose again? And I have to go look it up, right? Because I'll, I'll have I'll have the uh, responses. But please record it in your notes app as soon as you pick it, okay? So I'm going to post this um, after, our, after I finish speaking here. The other thing I want to highlight is um, your, your third blog post assignment. So I'm going to be uh, assigning. So you got two things I'm assigning today, um, my two smaller things. One is you're going to make a play pose at lesson, okay? Hopefully we'll get oh, so some of you will finish tonight so I can start releasing some tomorrow. Uh, it is due tomorrow, uh, in, in, in any case, uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, okay? But um, so, you, you know, our, our keynote, we'll get right on that. And then there is the third blog post, okay? So blog post number three. And, and I want you to just review today's lesson by uh, posting your picture and paragraph, uh, answering the, the questions, how can biblical truth um, play a role in education today? Right. How, how can the Bible continue to be relevant as a textbook? You know, you know why? Why do we even continue to look and study the Bible? Right, when we have some other sources that we uh, consider to be truthful. Okay, and uh, I've added to that. Why do you think religious truth, the stories in the Bible? Why do you think they change so little compared to to other stories? You know, uh, you know, science, medicine, history. Those things change all the time. Uh, textbooks get updated with, with, with different information. Um, this theory suddenly uh, proves this one wrong and, and whatnot. New things show us that what we believed even just a short while ago may have, you know. Um, but the yeah, biblical truth hasn't changed at all, right? It's the same Bible. I mean, it, there's some differences in small details from translation to translation. Was it three? Was it 
was it a serpent, a snake, a rattlesnake? I don't know what, an apple, a red color apple, green color apple, but that doesn't matter. But the basics, the basic part of the story stay, stay the same. Certainly the gospel stories haven't, no one's really kind of changed anything in those, okay, in Jesus' stories. Why do you think that is? And, and how can that, how can these stories still, um, why is it that these stories can still play a role in teaching young people today? Okay, so that will be blog post number three, right? This will be a third blog post, and then you will have a chance to um, make your play pose it tonight, okay? You're gonna have a chance to do that too. All right, so uh, once again, you're gonna uh, pick your story, and you're gonna find a video on that story, okay, for the play pose it. Uh, I, you know, I, I pretty much checked that there's, there's YouTube videos on, there's multiple YouTube videos on all those stories. You know, I, I don't think I found one that was, and just make sure you find a decent one, right? Not not too long, you know, a half an hour story, right? But not too short, like, you know, 30 seconds would be too short. So find, a, you know, the, a, a decent version of the story or something about the story, and then uh, make your play pose it, okay? All right. So there we go. Okay. At this point, um, I'm going to open up if, if there's any questions uh, for for you at this point from you to um, to ask me uh, regarding the two assignments I've just given as homework. Okay, just make sure that that's all I'm got for today. Yes, yes, yes. We've covered quite a bit. Very good. Thank you very much for uh, joining me today in today's lesson. I hope you um, learned something, enjoyed something, and, uh, and look forward to seeing your blog posts and your, um, especially your play posted activities. Okay. All right. Take care and see you next time.